haven't seen you in a million years. I know. How are, how are things? Great. Just wonderful. Good. All right. Tell these two young lads where we first met. Uh, well, I worked with you uh, for a summer in Aspen. That's the first time I believe we met. We were students, right? Well, you, I was one of your students, yeah, in 2005, way back in the day. Oh, right, right, right. I, I thought we had been students together, but uh, you, don't, <laughs> you're, you don't do that I'm old. Not that old. No offense, but I'm not that old. <laughs> you're not that old. <laughs> I didn't study with Saul Goodman. Hi, everyone. Today's date is September 1st, 2019. You're listening to your episode 193 of At Percussion. My name is Ben Charles. At, with me, as always, are Casey Cangelosi. Hey, how's it going, everybody? And Carly Vigna is out today dodging hurricanes. So in from the sub list, we have Bill Schultes. How's everybody doing? Bill, how's your school year getting started up? Uh, this was week one, so the madness ensues. Yes, I, I know the feeling very is it well. Just a, is it just a slog of email for everybody, I assume? S slog of email, slog of freshmen, not knowing where yeah. to go and what to do. Yeah, Mostly that, day. yeah. Uh, my favorite freshman moment was we have our uh, all of our studio classes are Monday at 2 o'clock. And so on the schedule, it, it says that your lesson is Monday at 2 o'clock. For some, like they you know block that out on the schedule like that, which is pretty smart. But for some reason, the marimba practice room across my hallway is the room number for everything. So I had two saxophone freshmen and one uh, voice freshman standing outside my office trying to get into a practice room they don't have access to, which was a pretty funny moment for me. <laughs> <laughs> I was delighted because it was the typical dose of email, and then come Friday, it just came to an abrupt screeching halt. Um, it was just suddenly all the business was done. So yeah, I was relieved. So our guest today is Jonathan Haas, who's been hailed by Ovation Magazine as the Paganini of timpani. He performed the only solo timpani recital at Carnegie Hall in 1980, and he made his debut as an orchestral soloist under Maxim Shostakovich with the New York Chamber Orchestra. His repertoire spans from Edgar Varez to Frank Zappa, and he premiered the Philip Glass Concerto Fantasy for Two Timpanists in 2000, which was written specifically for him. He's taught on the faculty of New York University, where he currently teaches, Juilliard Pre, excuse me, Juilliard Pre College, Peabody Conservatory, and the Aspen Music Festival. So welcome. Welcome to the podcast, Jonathan Haas. Thank you. Thanks, guys, for having me on. This is really a wonderful opportunity to reach out to lots of percussionists interested in what we all do and what we love to do. And Jonathan, I think you said you're on the mend from some surgery and you had a, a precautionary tale for young percussionists to share to start out. Young, young and old alike, um, not only Bill Mersh, but... Uh, you got to you got to watch your backs, everyone. I've just had some back surgery, and it was a result of overuse, uh, lifting up some very very heavy percussion instruments uh, wrongly. I've only been doing this for a career, and um, when you start early and being smart, um, it's 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 going to be a, a great advantage to you. So, uh, if you ever get yourself into a situation where, say, some stage hand says, okay, I want you to take those four Adams timpani and uh, I, I want you to take them to Newark uh, and push them over and you're in New York City. Uh, you certainly are and should be in a position to know yourself, know yourself well and say, I'm not capable of doing that. Either I'm going to need some help or you'll have to solve that problem. And I found... Uh, now this is going to be my I'm going in my 37th year in both teaching and mentoring and playing myself that there is an expectation of us us percussionists timpanists all the things that we do of people who don't do what we do thinking that it's okay because we play these instruments to request that we move them and there are times in which it's not so um, I'd like to begin a uh, both a message and a uh, an, an important initiative that we all together let the people who don't know what we can and can't do, what we can and can't do. Yeah, what, that's a great way to say it. And I, Gal, I know that you know, fellow colleagues or students that aren't percussionists or sometimes percussionists themselves, they're, they don't 
offer to help because they assume you don't want the help and they worry they're going to damage an instrument. Right. But uh, in, my, in my experience, people often want to help and with just a little encouragement, like, oh, yeah, just grab the timpani there when you wheel it. That'll be fine as long as we're not uh, doing any lifting or anything. It's scary thing about back injuries, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jonathan, they, they'll come out of nowhere, right? Like at least like if you're, if you're having a, you know, a, like a repetitive injury, you'll get some warning. It's like your wrist will start to uh, wear on you if you've been practicing too much. But something like a back injury, I mean, bam, they can just hit you, right? Yeah, and that's that's precisely what happened to me. It, it occurred um, the summer. It came out of nowhere. Uh, at after speaking with the surgeon, it's not something you can plan for. You know, once in a while you, we get a twinge in our back. Okay, that's fine. But this did come out of nowhere. And then my problem was I had to get on an airplane to China uh, and go and do a uh, a competition for a week and come back again. And then by the time I got back, I was, I was in bad shape. So my own story is only meant to be an encouragement for those, uh, for all of us to know what our limits are and also to have some instruction. And, and this is not rocket science, but to have some instruction on how to lift heavy things. But there's a point in which it's too heavy and that's okay. Adams made beautiful, wonderful timpani for all of us to enjoy. As an example, not the only company, but that was an instrument that um, that I I sort of had a tangle with. Um, and uh, it, we we got to know our limits, and people have to listen more carefully to our concerns about our bodies and about what we're capable of. So it does come out of nowhere, but. The problem with a back injury is that it can ha it, it will change your life immediately um, because the amount of, of pain and the injury that is a result of that. So I don't, I don't want to spend a lot of time on something that sounds actually very negative, but I, I want this to sound very positive for everyone that there are solutions and that the solutions are to speak up. If you're asked to move a set of chimes and the chimes have to be carried up um, stairs, you can say no. You are within your rights uh, just as a, as a person. But also one of my jobs in New York City that I have is that I'm a, a music contractor. I hire musicians to play all over New York City with orchestras uh, throughout the city, throughout the world, actually. And... Uh, there are also protections within um, good practices that at times when you're a student, and I, I know that I've been somewhat uh, at times where I say to a student, oh, go and do something, uh, lift that thing up. And I think that, that students should know that, that they can say, that's too heavy for me, or I don't feel comfortable, or let me get a buddy. Let me get three or four people to help out. And, and that, that's okay. And, I, and I, I think we should have a message going out far and wide because without our bodies functioning, you can have the greatest brain in the world. And um, I, I'm, I'm sure that's all what you know, we want for ourselves. But if we, if we can't move, we're out of business. Wow, thank you. Jeez. I just wanted to bring up one, one resource for everyone, especially dealing with hopefully injury prevention. Uh, the Percussive Arts Society does have a health and wellness committee that obviously focuses on a lot of these things, probably more on the playing side than the lifting side. Um, but Casey actually took a nice initiative to uh, start getting some PAS committees on this podcast for a roundtable, and the wellness committee will be our guest next week. Um, wow. So definitely check that out. Bill um, still hasn't replied to the email, by the way. <laughs> I'm lame. What can I say? He, he, but, he, has, he has all the time in the world to rave to me about the new Tool album, but... When it comes uh, down to business. I have priorities, man. I'm sorry. I, I understand. <laughs> but uh, Jonathan brought up a lot a lot of uh, what you've done over the past uh, a few decades really is one portion of your career has been the percussion rental business in the busiest city in the world, probably. Um, and on episode 156 with Bill Mersch, um, we, we discussed you in depth <laughs> and the rental business came up. 
And one thing I, I read in something, some sort of bio online, and if you're interested in how it kind of started, there's we talked about that and there's an article about it. Um, but I had a question. One thing that came up was that your father was the CEO of Sealy Posturepedic, which to me just sounded like a, a weird factoid. But Bill Mersh actually said, no, actually that I think gave John a lot of business sense about himself. So did that like have a business background in the family help you in your getting started with the rental business? Well, it, uh, not with the rental business, but with the idea of being a businessman, uh, I'll, I'll re uh, my father was a great man, and thank you for bringing this up. Um, the one thing he said to me was, you can do anything you want to do in your life, anything, but you cannot come and work for me. And indeed, he was the CEO of the largest mattress company in the world, and he said, you can do anything you want, but you can't do that. And I sort of scratched my head as a young lad, and I went, okay, let's, uh, let's figure that one out. And uh, I had uh, been accepted to the Juilliard School uh, for my master's degree. And, and you, you were also a gymnast at I, one point? I, 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 yeah, th that was a very silly thing I did in high school, but I was a gymnast till, uh, because marching band or doing gymnastics, uh, that was my choice, so... Luckily, I, I ended up going to marching band after that. But, but we'll talk, if you want, we can talk about why did gymnastics have anything to do with my, I, my uh, goals of being a soloist. Because when you're a gymnast, you're by yourself. And, and I did, okay, don't laugh, I, w I did trampoline. So that's a gymnastic sport. And you do it by yourself, and it's really dangerous, speaking about hurting your back. Oh, and yeah, you go, they go 50 feet in the air. Oh, it's it's nuts. So, um, but that's what I did in, for the for my high school sports, and I enjoyed being by myself, doing you know the flips and the flippus and the inside out and all that kind of stuff. Problem was, it was too dangerous, and I was at a, a gymnastic meet and I fell off the trampoline, and at that point announced to uh, my mom, who was schlepping me around, also with my drum set for all my uh, rock band gigs. I said, I don't really want to do this anymore. And she said, cool, you're done. So, you know, it, mm. it's interesting in life. You, you, you try things out and sometimes it's the, literally the, the level of either danger or the outcome that can dissuade you from doing something. And you use good sense and you go, okay, well, that's it. I tried it. Enough of that. And I didn't get hurt. So that really is the important thing, not to take it to the, to the edge. And when I watch the extreme sports, which I love, you know, the guys on the bicycles going upside down nine times, um, I'd much rather be watching that on television than actually even trying to figure out how they did it. So for all of the extreme folks, be careful. Um, going back to uh, uh, my own background and being told by my dad, you can do anything but work for me, that's when I that was a, a, a turning moment where I said, well, the message is I got to, I got to make my way in the world the way I'm going to make my way in the world. And I had the fortunate opportunity of traveling with him when he would go to different um, manufacturers, uh, which were all around the world. And I watched how my father interacted with the people that he worked with. And the most impressive part was that he, when he would walk into a mattress factory, the person who had the hardest job, who was probably the lowest paid person in the factory, knew who my father was and he knew who they were. And that was a defining moment for me, which when I decided to go and create a, a spin-off business in the music world with a percussion rental company, that I enjoyed the same sense of getting to know the Carnegie Hall stagehands and their families, and who was well and who wasn't feeling well, and at Avery Fisher Hall. So I knew everybody, and I still do to this day, throughout New York City. I know that I know the guard who lets you into Lincoln Center or or not. And I always found that it was the the people behind the scenes who were doing making the things happen that were so very important. Well, that was a lesson that I learned from my father and that these people receive the highest respect as the most important conductor that I would ever work with.
Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, certainly whenever I play with an orchestra um, or have played with an orchestra, you, you need to be friends with, you need to reach out to anybody that's working behind the scenes, helping you, whether it's a stagehand, whether it's management, you know, just be friends with everybody. I mean, same thing with the teaching, I think, um, you know, knowing everybody who's on the support staff to help you, it just makes your, I know it makes my job a lot easier when we're all simpatico about those sort of things. Well, and the favors they can do for you versus right. it's just, yeah, yeah. Right, but, the, but I, I, w I would say that the three of you sit with me in this podcast because it's more than the favors that they will do for you. It's because of what you have done for them. And life is one in which people are going to reciprocate. And for those who don't or don't get it, that's okay, too. Because there's always going to be somebody who's cranky. There's going to be somebody who got up on the wrong side of the bed. And there's always going to be somebody that has a backache. I can promise you that. And the three of you are have the success that you have because you send it back and you get it. And I think that as a percussion community, there's nobody better than any of us as a community because we are so involved with what's going on throughout an orchestra or a contemporary music ensemble or percussion ensemble, we don't just show up with our, let me, let me take an example without getting in trouble, a bassoon, although uh, I have lots of bassoon friends, but they don't, they're not gonna get into the belly of the beast. We are in the belly we, and, and we're the ones who either make it the most wonderfully exciting and fun experience, and we can also make it miserable for everybody and, uh, I, I would recommend everybody go for the, the first choice. If you want to be, you want to have so many years of, of enrichment and fun and, and just having the time of your life, take that high road. Always take the high road. Um, try to be the one understanding complicated situations where you're seeing people uh, sometimes very stressed out, um, very unhappy about something. And instead of joining in with that, Try to be the problem solver. Absolutely. So one question I know, um, Jonathan, I was interested in asking you uh, when I got invited in this podcast is you studied, obviously, with Saul Goodman. You were one of his last students at Juilliard. You'd mentioned you had, you had gone to Juilliard for your studies. And um, for those of you who might be younger in the audience and don't know the name Saul Goodman, you definitely need to. Um, Saul Goodman is one of the giants, one of the titans in our field, and certainly um, nearly every timpanist in America and nearly every um, I, I, nearly every timpanist, nearly every percussionist has some sort of lineage to either Saul Goodman or Cloyd Duff or Fred Hinger. Um, so he's that important. And so I just love your thoughts on, on studying with Mr. Goodman, um, how it was, um, what are the things that you learned from him in your studies? Ah, Bill, thank you. What a, what a wonderful question. Um, Sal Goodman did not teach. Um, Sal Goodman performed for you. And you either paid attention or you didn't. Now, we had lots of wonderful um, sayings and uh, that, that any Goodman student will repeat, don't bang, and things like that. But the experience with Sal was... Uh, Mr. Goodman, we would call him. I, I didn't call him by his first name until he and I went on a tour of playing the Bartok Sonata together in West Palm Beach, believe it or not, when he was uh, in his uh, later years. But uh, Mr. Goodman taught by example, by playing for you. And then you would play for him. Usually he didn't like it. And if you took exception to that, there was nothing to be learned. If when he said he didn't like something because you would look over at the couch and he would be making a face like he just bit into a, a terrible lemon and you would say, Mr. Goodman, what is it about that Sibelius uh, 2 passage that you don't like? He would tell you, honestly, it was all based on honesty and being forthright, yet uh, in my own uh, personal experience where I think I benefit benefit it is that I didn't let him gloss over something. Well, that doesn't sound very good. Uh, 
show me how to do it. And then I would do it and he would say, well, that's okay. And I would say, that's not okay with me that it's okay. I need it to be as good as you. And then he would say, then he would come over and he would say, let's, let's have at it. Because he loved to compete. He loved to come over and say, okay, you want to see how I did this, uh, this passage for Bernstein? I'm going to show you. And then I remember once where I'm watching this, I'm literally underneath the drums. He's looking around and he's going, hey, Haas, where'd you go? Where, where, where the hell you go? Right. And he's always smoking a cigar, by the way, in the lessons. And the cigar had come from Ruth Underwood, had, who had been on tour with Zappa. And she was sending Goodman Cuban cigars because Zappa was, was one, one of the first rock guys to be allowed into Cuba to play. And she got him a bunch of Cohiba cigars. So he, if you drove in Sal's car with him, he's smoking Cohiba cigars. All right, so he's smoking the cigar. He's playing Sibelius too. I'm under the drums watching his hands. And he's yelling, hey, Haas, where the hell did you go? I'm trying to show you this thing. And I go, Mr. Goodman, I'm down here. Now he looks at, down at, at the floor. He goes, what the hell are you doing down there? And I said, I'm looking at your hands. I want to see what you're doing. And he goes, get up here, for God's sakes. You're not going to play the drums down on the floor. That is a very typical Goodman lesson. But the spirit of, of his wanting to uh, share this with all of us down the line, and you guys are, are with me, we're, we're all down the line together, was, um, it, 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 it was something else. It, it was extraordinary because every moment that I knew that man, he was always playing music in his head. One quick story. So his daughter asks me to go to uh, LaGuardia and pick him up at the airport, coming back up from West Palm because he had a place down there. And uh, so we pick him up. I, I, I drove his caddy down uh, to LaGuardia with his daughter. And we pick up Mr. Goodman. And um, we get him in the car. And uh, they've all, and I said, now I'm in the back seat because Mr. Goodman wants to drive his Cadillac. He doesn't want me to be driving. He says, I'm going to drive us home. And I remember the two of them up in the front, and Saul's just driving, and his uh, daughter turns to him and says, Daddy, what piece are you playing? Because Saul was singing something. And he, he turns to her and he goes, oh, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's Fide I'm playing Fidelio uh, with, uh, uh, with Reiner. I'll never forget that. It was beautiful. Music truly was this man's life, and he was also a great humanitarian and, and loved to share it with all of us. It's, it's so funny for me to hear all this because I just finished Breaking Bad, and the lawyer in Breaking Bad is also named Saul Goodman. <laughs> you just finished Breaking quite, Bad? Yeah, I'm like way late to the party, I know. Don't, don't read me on that. But yeah, uh, quite, quite the opposite uh, of the actual Tempanist Saul Goodman, which I have to wonder if they, if they heard that name somewhere. Anyway, sorry, that was just my little anecdote. Casey, you had something. <laughs> I, you know, my, my, uh, the Goodman book I teach from in my office, of course, I've got one in English, but I have the Japanese edition that Eric Odaimo gave me. I don't know why that's fun. That's more fun for me for some reason. No, that's... no, let me, let me tell you when that happened. That actually was an incredible moment in Mr. Goodman's life. There was a student, and I don't know who it was, so forgive me, but it was someone who would come to study with Mr. Goodman and offer to translate that into Japanese. And at the time that this occurred, the relationships still, as a result of uh, post-World War II, was not, a, we, we were all learning how to share. I was in one of the first orchestras that started going to Japan on a very, very regular basis with mostly Mozart, uh, New York Pops was going over. This is in the, um, this would be in the 80s when the, the dollar and the yen uh, were, were very competitive. And this student, and uh, once again, I'm sorry who, th that I can't attribute this to, offered to translate, the, translate that book into Japanese meant more to Mr. Goodman um, than you can imagine because this, this meant that the barriers that divided our, our lives with, with people who we should have never been divided from from the first place, this was a way to make a connection. And that Japanese translation for Mr. Goodman 
was of tremendous, tremendous significance that that happened. Hmm. So, so keep that book close, uh, close by. Don't, don't loan that one out because it, it, it really is an, an important moment for all of us. Well, thanks. I enjoy it because a, a dear friend gave it to me, and also I've you know, I've not seen the Japanese version. It's it's cool to it's yeah, cool to it have. Really is. Casey, when was the last time you think Erico played out of that book? <laughs> right. Well, that's why she gave it to me. She's like, I I don't. I'm not going to play timpani for. <laughs> <laughs> I think she's doing just fine. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think she's hey, doing all Casey, right. I have a question about that. The like the the Goodman book that I have. The, like the cover looks like it hasn't been updated since it came out. Does the Japanese one have the same cover? <laughs> uh, give me a quick time out. I'm going to grab it. And here's a trivia Thanks. question for for some people out there. Uh, they, and in the updated version of the Goodman book, who is the conductor on the front cover? And where was the shot taken? Wow, Bill, I, I don't know. I thought it was going to be a Breaking Bad trivia. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. I You're blurred, blurred out. Oh, let me unblur. I know my new, com- my new, uh, my new computer does the... Uh... Oh wow! Look at that. Look at that. Yeah, it's fun. That's yeah. cool. This. Great. Can we? Can I say something about that reedition that Roland and and uh, uh, Gary Wurzheim did? Of course. Um. And uh, and this is meant with with the greatest respect for two of our most iconic uh, percussionists. Um, there are some of the exercises were are out of order, and they're not in the order that Mr. Goodman had originally published them. And I do not know why that occurred. And when I teach the book, I teach the, it, this is the front of the book, the first 25 exercises. And the one in particular that got changed was the first role exercise uh, I believe, which is number 14, if you have the original, it's the last one, and that was always the first of the roll exercises. And there's not that many. There's, like, what, one, two, three, four. There's six roll, those little A2 things. And I'm not sure why Gary and Roland decided to put some of, uh, take some of those things out of order. And it's not the end of the world, but I would like, if for those who are listening to this podcast, that I recommend highly um, that that you put those role exercises in the order that Goodman had originally intended them to be. The other thing mm-hmm. about the addition that Gary and, and Roland did is they put stickings in, and what I do is I have my students take white out, and they have to white all the stickings out, because Mr. Goodman was not a stickler for sticking. For stickings, in fact, uh, I would go as far as to say is that he was the one who uh, was very convincingly um, adamant that cross-sticking was part of the art form of the instrument. And to have stickings in his book that portray cross-sticking as something that is either should be avoided or not used or minimized is actually inaccurate. And... Uh, hmm. If anybody listens to your podcast, which I think trillions of people must, um, definitely that would be helpful. So here's what Mr. Goodman told me exists, and I have not found it yet. There is supposedly a letter that Beethoven wrote to a friend of his, describing why he wrote in the Eighth Symphony the cross sticking of the low F and the high F at the high rate of speed in which there's a letter in which Beethoven describes that he wants to see the sticks over the head of the timpanist when performing it uh, at the very end, especially when it's very loud. That the idea of seeing the mallets crossing was the intention of the passage. Wow, cool. Hope to find that letter (laughs) before... So, uh, uh, but I, I'm on the search. So, if anybody's got the letter, forward it to me immediately. I'd be most grateful. Yeah, that's I mean, so cool. I've never heard of that. Yep, that's great. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely interesting since the timpani does come from that sort of a background, especially in the the high baroque era. Going into going into the classical era, certainly there was a lot of ceremonial um, aspects about the the technique. Yeah. And uh, do do you find that cross sticking is still like an essential? 
uh, part of the uh, musician's toolbox, and I mean that. So some timpanists, for instance, prefer to do shifting whenever possible. Obviously, there's times like Berlioz Fantastique, Fifth Movement, you're going to have to do a cross-sticking. But other than that, many passages you can do with just shifting versus cross-sticking. Do you have an opinion on one versus the other? Um, if it feels good, do it. There you go. And I'm, I, I love cross. I, I cross, but I'm not crossing my mallets because I'm saying, oh, that is the technique to use. I'm doing it because I got to go really fast and I don't want to screw it up. And I got a conductor doing the Beethoven's uh, third symphony, uh, seventh symphony, and I'm doing the last movement. And they decide that uh, they got ants in their pants, right? And you're going, well, we never rehearsed it that fast. Right. So sometimes my plan was, well, I can cross stick that. And then there's sometimes you go, I don't even know how I lived through that. But you do. And your toolbox then all of a sudden becomes very surprising what you can do in the moment. But what we we practice this stuff so that when we have to either make the choice or the choice isn't made for us because of a tempo, we can do it. And and uh, it, 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 it'll go, it'll go into a very natural moment in which your body is going to tell you how you're going to be able to go at a temple like that. Related to that, Bill, thank you for asking that question. As I did mention, uh, I'm, I'm going to China a lot. And one of my great interests uh, recently in having gone there, I was actually there with Erica Daimo and Pius Chang. We were at the first international a percussion competition in um, in a beautiful town. Uh, it'll come to me back in a minute. Uh, my anesthesia is still wearing off. <laughs> um, but we had such a great time. And we had to, uh, actually, I had to adjudicate the Chinese percussion competition. And the Chinese percussion competition, is, they usually set up four, five, or six drums. Um, and they are they are crossing crazy. They make us look like a bunch of amateurs when it comes to crossing. And the sound and the flow of the line that they're playing when they're playing these solo um, uh, Chinese pieces is so elegant, but it's so fast. And I looked at this and I said, that has really once again, even after all these years of doing this, it really solidified how there's in many different cultures we're doing the same thing for the same outcome. So it gives me even more uh, gratification in that what I've been trying to teach to, to others and, and incorporate in my own playing, I see in other cultures, and especially it, it was uh, apparent in, in, uh, in Chinese Western, I mean, uh, Chinese authentic percussion, which I'm going to become much more educated about for myself, because i got to go back and do a lecture on it in two weeks if the doctor lets me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully hopefully you're uh, in good enough shape to make that trip, for okay. sure. That is no joke across the Pacific. <laughs> well, actually, the way you're going, you're probably going over Europe, right? Um, you know something? You get on the airplane, I, I close my eyes, and whatever yeah, exactly. the direction they take me, I go. <laughs> don't think about it. Yeah, right. like, don't watch, watch the clock or movies. <laughs> so Ben wanted me to answer the, uh, the trivia question I said at the top of this regarding the Goodman book, the updated cover of it. And so what the question I had asked was, who is the conductor on the cover and where is it? Uh, where is the concert happening? So the answer is Bernstein in Carnegie Hall. Ding, ding, okay. ding, winner, winner, chicken dinner. I was, I was going to guess Bernstein, but yeah, I didn't know the hall. <laughs> I, I was going to ask. That's gonna the ask. old hall, though. That's the old concert hall, right? Yep. Before, way, way before the, the renovation. And Mr. Goodman, in that picture, is has his timpani position uh, on Carnegie Hall stage, in which before they did the renovation, that was the freight elevator in which they would use to get the pianos and the timpani to go up and down. So Goodman positioned, positioned himself there because he found that the timpani had added acoustical properties by standing, by having the timpani there, and convinced Bernstein that whenever they played at Carnegie Hall, that would be his position. When they redid the hall, they put concrete 
uh, supports and they built Zankel Hall underneath it. And unfortunately, that was a sweet spot for timpani and it no longer exists. Mm-hmm. Wow. I was, I was going to ask you, Jonathan, what, what, you, you know, you mentioned this cool supposed letter from Beethoven requesting the ceremonial style, as Bill put it, up in the air, big crosses, F to F, across the drums. Why do you think we've lost that? You know, I mean, I, I've always been taught, you know, only cross if you have to, try to be as even as possible always, shift is preferred over cross. Uh, you know, wh- wh- why do you think we, I, I don't know, like, where did that go? Well, um, I, my answer is that I don't know because I, I always felt that I was, uh, when, I, when I was your age, of you guys, I was the counterculture. And I railed against that. And, and when I uh, had friends uh, uh, and we talked about this and they said this is what their teachers told them to do and all that, I, I did not accept that. And it was one of the reasons uh, that I wanted to become a solo timpanist and to have works uh, created so that the majesty, that the excitement, that the visual, the, the, the visceral aspects of playing timpani would be brought out. Um, so I, I, I was never accepting of that, but I'm respectful of the fact that there are people who feel that way and I'm sure they had very, very good reasons Mr. Duff is a good example of that because he and I also late in my uh, late in his life um, and late in my educational life, where I learned he was coming to Aspen before I got onto the faculty. When I came onto the faculty there, he was still doing his timpani seminar, and I began attending all of his seminars. Um, and I and it really where this came from, I believe this is my personal belief is that George Zell wanted something much different from Chloe Duff than Leonard Bernstein and Boulez and Furt Wangler wanted from Goodman. And uh, Zell wanted Duff to have his sound inside, low down in the orchestra. He did not want Duff's sound necessarily to be as present. And I don't mean that as a positive or a negative, but that Mr. Duff then created mallets and a way of playing and uh, of a use of a type of timpani that put him more inside of the tonalities, whereas what really we do know is that especially Bernstein and and Toscanini also, uh, Goodman was 19 years old when he got the gig, when it was the New York uh, Symphony um, Society, and he was basically learning on Toscanini's time. He said, I always learned on the boss's time. I never really had a lot of teachers, although Oscar Schwar was uh, uh, a, a very important person uh, as one of his teachers. But getting back to that, to Bernstein, Bernstein wanted Goodman's sound to be in front of the orchestra. So when you go and listen to those Mahler uh, um, symphony sets and the timpani are so present, that's a result of this is what the conductors wanted. So I don't think that all of us timpanists are necessarily, we're making the decisions and then coming on to the job and saying, okay, here it is, take it or leave it. I think that sound quality thus approach is a result of the collaboration between the conductor of the orchestra and the timpanist. Talk to Dave Herbert sometime because We had a wonderful opportunity to talk about how his change from San Francisco to Chicago um, was, uh, he he had to go through that process of when he was in San Francisco, and and I'm not going to tell Dave's story, that's not necessary, but he was playing with much more presence of of sound in San Francisco. In other words, he's playing a lot louder. (laughs) And when he got to Chicago, my understanding was, is it took him a while to settle into a different sonic um, uh, landscape that is what that orchestra wanted, which was much different than what San Francisco at Davies Hall was doing. So the art form of what we're doing is not landing in the chair and saying, here I am, take me or leave me, because believe me, they'll leave you, by the way, if you're not doing what they want you to. 
but the idea is here I am. I'm going to give you what I think you want. I'm going to give you what I have learned, what I have studied, what I've researched. But if you don't like it, tell me what you want and I'll change it. And that's how I believe everyone, especially of our most iconic timpanists, approach their jobs, which was by learning on the job. Wow, great. Well, we do have a handful of Facebook questions, and they're all kind of, for some reason, kind of then and now questions. And I guess I'll start with one from our buddy, Senya Komanovich. Ben, did I say her last name right? Do you know? Does anybody know? I don't know. I don't <laughs> think she even knows. I think she doesn't know. <laughs> wow. So, right, she's, she's a buddy. She's been on the show a couple of times. But Senya says, would your approach to a career pursuit be any different if you were a student today? Um, no, I, 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 it's a great question. Um, my answer is more, would be more towards not for my own self, but for my students, uh, of the here and now in which I would say, yes, that what I did not know and what I still do not know um, I think many of you need to know, and if you don't know it, you need to find out about it. Now, let me be specific. I'm going to give you a very specific example of what I'm talking about. Um, I have begun a program at NYU, and, and I'm not being self-serving. This is just to answer the question. Um, I see that in uh, New York City, the... Broadway industry last year brought in $3 billion in revenue. I saw this as a indication that students having the skills for those who were interested, who thought this was something they wanted to do, I saw this as a, a monetized opportunity. So, I have so many of my former students who are doing Broadway shows, and Broadway shows pay a lot of money, especially for percussionists because of doubles. Um, and then I began a seminar for percussionists that we do at NYU, which studies specific, specific shows. And I saw that for myself, I had inadequacies in my own training that would not have allowed me to become a successful Broadway musician, which was Latin percussion, ethnic percussion, um, things such as that, because that was not on offer. You had to seek that out back in the 70s and, uh, and the 80s when I, when I was a student, um, which I did, but not at the level that I should have. So I began as a result of of all this, we've started the first Broadway orchestra program in the United States at NYU, in which students, they, Casey, they got to learn all your music that you write, which I absolutely adore your pieces. They are so clever. They are, they, <laughs> oh, thanks. But, but, not, but not clever in, in, a, in a kitsch way that the skill sets to, when, when you play your piece, they're in the, they're the theatrics, the shadows, the playing with a metronome, all of the different skills, and these are all transferable to, to Broadway. Now, oh, thanks a lot. Jeez, that's we're, kind. We're getting highly specific because it's not about Broadway. It's about all of us who love drumming, finding some place to drum. And folks, we're going to have to get paid some, at some point or it's just going to be a hobby. And that is, to me so very important that somebody who is going to put in this amount of time into their life to study something and to love it, that they have options. And so this young lady asked a, a, a wonderful question. If I could turn the clock back, I would have studied in Cuba. I would have gone and learned steel pan. I would have learned so many more things than I had access to or I knew that I needed. But now that I see what I see, I, I actually 
you know, you can ask my students, especially at NYU, they're not forced, they're required to learn these skills because it's, it, it's going to bode so well and how we all make a living, yes, you can become the principal timpanist of an orchestra. It's fantastic. Yes, you be, can become the principal percussionist and in the section. But look at the numbers. The numbers are on the low side. That shouldn't be discouraging because there's so many other places when you're um, resourceful and you start your own little percussion quartet called So Percussion, and you go, what kind of name is that for So, S-O, and the next thing you know, you're a rock star. But that's because of love, dedication, and being really, really smart, and being willing to be flexible about what it is that you want to know and how you, you gain that information. So that's a very long answer to a very short question. And through example, um, I, I would say that things have changed drastically and, and all of us as teachers, uh, and you guys are now the master teachers that, that take on the, the flame here. We have to give our students every opportunity to flourish. And that means the world has gotten larger and larger and larger and, and we enlarge them with it. Well, wonderful information. I had a, actually a follow-up question to that, if I could kind of turn the question over on itself. Uh, could you tell us there's one student of yours in particular I want to ask about that's a relatively recent student, um, I guess actually not all that recent at this point, but it's had a very successful career. And I remember reading an article, and I wish I could tell you what article it was. There's an article a while back when you were teaching at Peabody and you were talking about how you thought it was important to look outside of classical music and look into rock and roll, which was really big and all that sort of stuff. And in this article, I think you said, like, I've got this young Bulgarian kid studying with me. <laughs> and that, of course, turned out to be who was my teacher at, at University of Miami, Svet Stoyanov. So could you tell us what you saw in Svet as a student that uh, that turned him into such a successful career man? And also, if you can get in a few embarrassing stories about Svet, that would be permissible as well. All right. Well, Svet should be embarrassed about anything I say about him because the, everything is true. And uh, Svet is my brother, um, not by birth. Uh, Svet and I uh, premiered the uh, Philip Glass Timpani Concerto together. And both he and I also uh, uh, performed it with the Chicago Symphony. And we were the first solo timpanists uh, to play with the Chicago Symphony, and Svet was by my side. Um, Svet came to his audition at Peabody um, from Bulgaria, off the airplane, and he brought his tapan. Everybody know what a tapan is? Shake your heads, I, yes. I need a reminder. A tapan is the double-headed Bulgarian drum that is played with a switch on one head and a stick on the other. Hmm. And you'll have to go study this with Svet because I do not play Tapan, but Svet has a career because of me because he played the Tapan at his audition. So hmm. Svet plays all the usual Delacluse and all that at his audition. And he says, uh, I have this drum from Bulgaria. Would you like to hear it? And I said, you better believe it. You just schlepped it on the airplane from Bulgaria. You better play the, the, play the drum. And Svet played a Tapan solo for his Peabody audition. And he blew the roof off of any audition that I've ever been at by what he played. And, and that was it. That was truly uh, the beginning of, of my admiration for what this young man is able to do, which is which is really uh, quite incredible. So that's that's the Svet story. <laughs> Bill, play it for him. Bill, we want to hear it. Bill, Bill just brought a Japan into the room. He happened to have one. Yeah, no, that's why Bill gets any job he wants. <laughs> right. So I'm going to write him back. And this is an instrument that uh, Bartok uh, really had in mind in the concerto for orchestra. Oh, okay. In the Miraculous Mandarin, where, yeah. where the bass drum has to play with the switch. I love that this, sound. This is, everybody listen to this instrument. This is what it should sound like when you play the Bartok. Right. This was, it, was, it was really originally 
it's a metaphor for it. Go, Bill. So oh, I'm yeah. certainly not Svet. Um, the, the old, so there's real, real quick story about this this Tupan uh, that I this was actually John Grimes's um, instrument that he gave me before he passed. He happened to own this instrument. I actually used it a couple of years ago when I did the Mason Bates Sideman Concerto with Wind Ensemble, which was actually written for Svet and was premiered by Svet down in Miami. Um, so by no means am I a, a, a master player at all, but this is kind of giving you the idea. Uh, of it. You have the two, you have a switch in one hand and you have this mallet in the other and you know, so something like that kind of gives you an idea of the, the different sound possibilities. And you can hit it in the center, get it towards the edge. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. So there you go, there, there it is. Now, I mean, you I, happen to have one right there. How how I rare did, is that? Did, I mean, what's the yeah. likelihood? I want to let everybody know on this podcast, Svet is an animal on that drum. Yeah. An animal. He is unbelievable when he plays that thing. There's there's a great YouTube video of him playing, if anyone wants to check it out. <laughs> yeah, editing the master doing it, not me. No, thanks, Bill. That's cool. No, thank, you for, <laughs> thank you for bringing that out, though. That, that was great. Thank you. <laughs> well, I, I don't know, but speaking of career stuff, and when you said the thing about Svet playing the, the Tapan, it popped into my head that you had a story about uh, you were um, applying for, I think, a grant to do a New York solo recital, and you were told, I'm sorry, Mr. Haas, we only fund musical instruments when you were applying to play timpani. <laughs> right, right. All right. Are you ready for the beginning of my career? This is, <laughs> all right, this is how my career started. Martha Baird Rockefeller Foundation um, had a program in place that would uh, fund a Carnegie Recital Hall debut for a soloist. And they would pay for the hall, they would pay for the, they pay for everything. So, okay, so that's what you applied for. So this is, uh, I'd gotten into the Charlotte Symphony. I was, uh, uh, I finished uh, at Juilliard and in my uh, uh, third year, I did a three-year master's because I didn't want to, I wanted to be with Goodman for three years. Uh, and the first timpani audition I ever took, my best friend said to me, don't take the audition because you're going to go win it, then you got to go. And uh, sure enough, I won it. And I went. And I wanted a fail-safe way to get back to New York City in case it didn't work out or I didn't like doing it or they didn't like me. Who knows? So I... Uh, found out that Karl Heinz Stockhausen had written a piece for uh, called Schlag Trio for two timpanists and piano that had never been performed in the United States. I wrote to Stockhausen because he had no phone. You couldn't call him. He had, there was no communications with him other than the mail. And I said, uh, I, I want to I play your piece at uh, Carnegie Recital Hall. And he wrote back and he said, fine, you, can, you have my permission to do the U.S. premiere. So I went, great, I'll apply to the Martha Baird Rockefeller Foundation. Cool, I was perfect. I was the perfect candidate, so I thought. And uh, so I made out the application and I get the letter in the mail that say, and I still have it, and it says, Dear Mr. Haas, thank you so much for applying to Martha Baird Rockefeller Foundation. However, uh, we are sorry to inform you that this foundation only supports uh, musical instruments. And um, you can imagine what that felt <laughs> like. Uh, <laughs> did, did they just not know what a timpani was? Well, wait a second. Wait, wait. The story gets better. All right, all right. Yeah. <laughs> so I look at this letter, and um, going back to uh, earlier in this podcast when we talked about my father, and I showed it to my dad, and he said, I said, seems like somebody doesn't quite understand what it is that you want to do. And I, and I said, what do you think I should do? He says, call him up. So I go, okay. So I called the secretary of the Martha Baird Rockefeller Foundation and I say, hi, I, I applied. I got this letter. And, and, and I said, a tremendous mistake has been made. And she said, what sort of mistake? And I said, I, I need to come in and share this with the president of the foundation because a very serious error has been made. And um, I was nice about it, but I was very firm about this. Okay, she said, I'll make you an appointment. Um, so I go down to one Rockefeller Center. You know where they put the Christmas tree up on television? 
Yeah, Home Alone. So I go down there, where, and the Christmas tree is up and all, and all that. And uh, I go into the main uh, office of the president of the Martha Berg uh, Foundation in a big leather chair, and he's got a big desk and lots of uh, posters of all oh, Yo-Yo Ma and everybody. I'm surrounded by the greatest musicians. And I sit in the chair and I go, Mr. President of the Foundation, I said, I have a question for you. And he says, and now remember, he also is looking at the letter that just said that I don't play a musical instrument. And he said to me, uh, Mr. Haas, yes, what's your question? And I said, Mr. President, do you happen to know who one of the most highly paid orchestral musicians in the world is, who that person would be in an American orchestra? And he said, no, wh wh who are you talking about? And I said, Vic Firth is the principal timpanist of the Boston Symphony, and he is one of the highest paid musicians of any musician in any orchestra in the United States. I said, did you know that? And he said, no. He said, I had no idea. And then I said to him, do, do you know who Sal Goodman is? And he says, well, of course I've heard his name. And I said, do you know that he played with the New York Philharmonic for 50 years with Toscanini and Reiner and Fred Wang and ba 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 And he goes, well, yes, I'm familiar with that. And I said, well, your letter says that you're only funding musical instruments. I said, my grant is for not only a musical instrument, but the most highly paid of the musical instruments in the orchestral world. And he said to me, I apologize. We have made a mistake. All right, the story gets even better. You want to hear more of this or you're bored? More. So he then says, here's what you need to do. Uh, everybody's seen The Wizard of Oz, right? And, and they got to go get the hat of the Wicked Witch of the North, and then they get it, and then they got to go get the broomstick. Remember that? Yeah. Kept making them do more crap along the way. All right, this is how this story goes. He said, okay, so uh, now that we're over that hurdle, I need you to come and do a half-hour timpani recital to demonstrate that you have music that's written for timpani that will satisfy the qualifications of a solo, of, of a recital, a Carnegie Recital Hall. And you have to do it at your own expense. The Martha Baird Rockefeller Foundation is not going to pay for it. Okay. I go, great. So um, remember, I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina. I'm the, uh, uh, the principal timpanist. So I have to come back to New York. I hire Carol Studios. I hire the New York City Gay Men's Choir. Um, I hire Bill Mersh. And I do the Samuel Barber, a stopwatch and an ordinance map for male choir and timpani and four obligato horns. Bill Mersh and I play Erwin Bazelon's partnership that was written for the two of us by Erwin Bazelon. I play several Carter solos and I have a piece for electronic tape and timpani written by, uh, written for me by uh, Tom Hamilton. And they bring in five experts in the Carroll Studios and I put on this recital. And after the recital, the five experts come up to me and they said, we had no idea that there was this level of music of interest written for this instrument. And I said to them, I know, that's why I'm trying to do this. This is why I want to do this thing. So they all, they go, great, we're going to report back to the Rockefeller Foundation people. All right, now in my story, you would say, oh, okay, Haas, yeah, he was successful. No, I hear nothing from the foundation. I decide on my own that I'm going to do the recital. I call up parents, uncles, aunts. I think I robbed a bank. I'm kidding. Um, and I got the money together and I rented Carnegie Recital Hall with my own money. 
and I did the Stockhausen because that's really why I wanted to do this. I wanted to do the, the U.S. premiere of a piece by Karl Heinz Stockhausen. That was a big deal. The place was packed. Bill Ludwig flew in from Chicago. The Ludwig uh, uh, Industries lent me the first set of ringer timpani that they brought into the country to play. Uh, Bill Ludwig sat next to Sal Goodman and they did not fight. They didn't punch each other. Buster Bailey came. The place was packed. I did the recital, start to finish. I had the, the most wonderful time of my life. The recital is over. Um, there is a line of people coming to congratulate, and a woman comes up to me. Her name was Kathy Hager. I did not know this woman. She came up to me in this long line of, of, of uh, well-wishers, and she said, I am from the Martha Baird Rockefeller Foundation, and here is the check to cover the cost of the recital. That's cool. That was it. That's way That's cool. cool. Yeah, Ben, I think you're going to give us a, a bio of a, a, a buddy of ours and of, of Mr. Haas's. Yeah, there's so so much great stuff. I feel bad we're like kind of running out of time at the end here. And we actually uh, on episode 156, I think it was, was the Bill Mersh episode. And on that episode, I reported on Jonathan Haas. So I figured I'd return the favor in reverse. Um, and I'm going to make this as short as possible because most of this you can read in a bio somewhere online. I'd rather hear Jonathan talk about it. But William Mersh uh, is a very famous, uh, mostly marimba player, but also very, very good at other things as well. He's originally from Ann Arbor, Michigan. He grew up near Gordon Stout. In fact, on his episode, he shared an interesting story about kind of uh, Gordon as he was going off to college, um, giving his blessing to a new marimba that Bill's school had bought. Bill studied at the University of Michigan with Charles Owen, also known as Charlie Owen, and he originally had the intention of transferring after one year to an elite East Coast conservatory, but after studying for a year with Charlie Owen, he realized that there was no reason to because he had a wonderful teacher there. After he graduated, he moved to New York City, and he realized many of his peers were uh, willing to write a work for him in exchange for a guaranteed premiere performance. Um, and so he said a lot of his early works were bought for a bottle of wine. Um, and so he commissioned many, many famous composers ultimately to write works for the marimba. Um, when he was in New York, he started something called the New York Quintet, which had the same instrumentation as Keiko Abe's Tokyo Quintet of marimba, flute, clarinet, double bass, and percussion. And so they were able to sort of share many of their works. In 1984, he headed up a National Endowment for the Arts grant, along with Lee Howard Stevens and Gordon Stout, and originally Michael Rosen, who later dropped out. This uh, 1984 project resulted in the 1986 premieres of Jacob Druckmann's Reflections on the Nature of Water, Roger Reynolds' Autumn Island, and Joseph Schwantner's Velocities. In 1986, after this, he founded uh, the New, new Music Marimba Incorporation, which is a nonprofit dedicated to procuring new works for the marimba. In 1991, uh, there was an NEA a consortium, uh, very similar, sorry, excuse me, there was not an NEA consortium, in 1991, the NEA Consortium was reorganized, which became the Meet the Composer slash Reader's Digest Commissioning Program, very similar to that 1984 program. At this point, he joined Nancy Zeltzman, Robert Van Sice, and commissioned three works, Steve Mackey's See a Thursday, Eugene O'Brien's Rhyme and Reason, which I've never heard of, and Gunther Schuller's Marimbology. He's commissioned dozens of well-known composers, including Erwin Bazelon, Erica Wazen, Libby Larson, Andy Thomas, James Wood, and Charles Warren, to name a few. He's performed with the American Symphony, the Metropolitan Opera, and the New York Chamber Symphony. He created degree programs and marimba performance at the Peabody Conservatory and Rutgers University. He serves as the principal timpanist of Sinfonia de Camera and the Champagne, Champagne Urbana Symphony Orchestra. He's still the artistic director for New Music Marimba. He's a signature innovative percussion artist, and he is now the professor of percussion at the University of Illinois, which is where I studied with him. And before Jonathan talks, I wanted to share one of my favorite uh, Haas slash Mersh stories. Mersh said that several years ago they were at PASIC, and there was someone on stage, I think I know who it was, but I won't say, and this guy was up on stage uh, just sitting there just trashing how stupid solo marimba was, and it's dumb to try and make a career in this, and John Haas was sitting there kind of giving Mersh <laughs> the elbow the whole time, 
And then the clinician up on stage. But of course, the only thing dumber than solo marimba is solo timpani. <laughs> and Mercer <laughs> and nudge back. <laughs> and to tie that together, Andrew Thomas actually wrote a piece that was uh, dedicated to both Bill and Jonathan called Hex and Gehoyla. So if you're looking for a great piece for timpani and marimba um, by Andrew Thomas, of course, did Merlin. Uh, that's a great addition to the repertoire. Yeah, and then there's also, uh, uh, Jonathan already mentioned, the uh, Irwin Bazelon partnership is also a marimba timpani duel. Um, but Jonathan, could you tell us about meeting Bill and, and how you've uh, grown to love each other? <laughs> we, it, 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 we didn't grow to love each other. We were demanded to love each other by Charlie Owen. We, <laughs> we met at the Aspen Music Festival when we were uh, young kids. And uh, the festival has changed tremendously uh, I just celebrated my 36th year on the faculty there, and I was a student for three years. Um, Bill and I learned how to ride a motorcycle together in Aspen, uh, and we didn't have a license together and probably uh, had things not gone as well. We'd both still be in jail. Um, but our first meeting was one in which a truck had to be unloaded of percussion instruments, and Bill, who had, uh, was a student presently with Charlie Owen, felt that he was in charge and i had uh, i was coming out of new york oh no no i was in st louis at the time sorry i wasn't even in new york yet and uh, i thought i was in charge and so the two of us were unloading this truck uh, and it, it it was so stupid because it was like put the snare drum box uh on this shelf and then i would take the snare drum box off the shelf that bill said and i said that belongs over here and before you know it, the two of us are in, literally in the dirt in front of the building, and we are basically sort of push fighting. And <laughs> now we're in the dirt, and we're rolling around and wrestling like a bunch of, uh, of children. And Charlie Owen, who, by the way, was, uh, he was a Christian scientist. Hmm. And uh, this was not, this was not okay. This was, this was way, 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 way off his... Uh, his comfort level, Charlie comes out and he was a big man and he came out and he took us both, he took us both out of the dirt, literally out of the dirt. And he held us by the scruffs of our necks. And he looked at both of us and I remember, and it was the kindest moment of my life where he said, boys, you're going to have to get along. And he put us down. And from that moment on, Bill's been my best friend. For my entire life. Now let me tell let me tell a great story uh, with Bill, so uh, so I get in trouble. Mexican dance, right? The most iconic, the most iconic marimba solo. Argue if you want. Everybody know what Mexican dances. You've all heard it, right? You betcha. Sure. So Bill Mersh and I are down. Uh, I think we were at Union Square, and Bill is to give the New York premiere, if not the world premiere of the first movement, because the second movement hadn't been written, at some sort of a gathering that, uh, that I was at. And at the gathering, they had wine. So Bill and I, and we weren't big drinkers. I think we were about 20, 21 years old at the time. Uh, no, 22. And so Bill has a glass of wine, and so do I. Now, Bill has to get up and play the first performance of the Mexican dances, and he's already pretty nervous about the whole thing, but he went and had a glass of wine before he played it. Not recommended, right, gentlemen? Right? That's not what we're teaching our students. Have a glass of wine and play your first Beethoven 9. It's risky, yeah. It's a bit risky. Huh? Yeah. It's a bit it's risky. risky. And Bill got up. I'm not sure what he played. But it sounded really good. And uh, that was the beginning of the Mexican dances as becoming one of the most iconic of the solos. But I was there to hear Bill play the first performance with a filled with a glass of wine. I was also his partner with the uh, New York Quintet. I was the percussionist. He was the marimbist. And we had uh, such, an, such a, an exceptional time together playing chamber music. This was at a time in which when you would go to a PAS convention and if somebody walked in the doors with a clarinet or with a double bass or something other than a drum, they were asked to leave. 
and the New York Quintet was clarinet, flute, double bass, marimba, and a percussionist. And we gave a recital at PAS with the New York Quintet because uh, we were collaborating with Keiko Abe with the Tokyo Quintet. And we were the first group to bring other instruments. Remember when the Rockefellers said that we weren't, but we were with other instruments um, and attempted to open up the scope and the, uh, the idea that PAS was not just only for drums, but it's a place for there to be music shared with each other. That's my, that's my Bill Mersh in the dirt. Bill Mersh at, uh, at the premiere of uh, Mexican dances. And then uh, from then on, we've, we've always stayed very close. And he's playing a lot of timpani, by the way. In yeah, that, no, he, now, now he oh, plays the timpani part on partnership. Oh, that, uh, that's a load. Uh, I'm going to call it that way. I'm, I'm <laughs> Which he's it. very proud of, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he should be. That's a really hard timpani part if you, if you haven't seen it. Now he's, uh, we also have to thank for Bill and singularly, um, and there are others of course, but I think singularly Bill shared with me, his, uh, Bill's father I believe was an engineer, had great business acumen as well, uh, was a scientist. Yeah, a chemist and, I think, yeah. Yeah, he was a scientist and Bill and I brought our influence from our fathers and he began something called Mallet Man Productions. Um, that he he himself was the first percussionist to be um, given not-for-profit status by the United States government, which then allowed him to apply to the National Endowment for the Arts. He was the first guy. And Bill and I were he was passionate about marimba. I was passionate about timpani. And we were both passionate about chamber music, and there was nothing that was going to stop us from doing what we wanted to do. And it really was Bill who set the stage for what now is a repertoire rich in content, rich in scope, and the access that we all have uh, to be able to get the funding, although it is limited, and we. We were, we were getting blood out of a stone even back then, but Bill needs to be given the credit for having set that path for all of us. Hmm. Great. Yeah, well said. So, so great to hear. Yeah. Well, we just have a few minutes here left to sort of wrap up. Casey, do you have a few news items to share with us today? Yeah, sure. So I'm trying to do every every release, something that happened today. And like Ben said, we are recording on September 1st. But if you're listening to this the day of the release, it should be September 5th. And some fun things and quick little trivia items that happened on September 5th. Actually, a lot of good stuff happened. A uh, slew of birthdays, so I'll just kind of rip through them. 1867 composer Amy Beach was born. Also, J.C. Bach, so Johann Christian Bach was born. And John Cage was born. And this one's for Bill Schultes. Do you know who Brad Wilk is? I've heard the name. Uh, I bet you had. He's going to date us again. But this is the drummer for Rage Against Rage the Machine. Rage Against the Machine. That's right, oh, man. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're, very, yeah. you're very good with this one era that... <laughs> Dude, the, uh, the late era. 90s is my wheelhouse. You have no idea. I know, idea. like you, your memory is very good. So anyway, a couple of birthdays. All those people share September 5th as a birthday. A couple other ones in 1913. What might be, uh, it's so hard to say what your favorite piece of music ever is, but definitely one of my favorite pieces of music is Prokofiev's second piano concerto. And this was performed for the first time with Prokofiev at the piano and apparently the audience is uh, strongly divided at the premiere so met with both uh, acclaim and disdain another one oh and by the way god if you're ever in that conversation that i know i've had with some um, friends is uh oh i'm just not really that into piano concertos well they haven't heard the prokofiev second piano concerto yet uh this is a cool one in 1961 duke ellington age 62 cancels a concert in little rock arkansas when he learns that the audience will be segregated so for, I, I read into this a little bit and from little rock culturevulture.com it's lrculturevulture.com 
They write, in August 1961, it was announced that Duke Ellington would perform a concert at the Robinson Center in Little Rock, Arkansas. He had previously played there in the 40s and 50s. His concert was set to be 8.30 Tuesday, September 5th. Due to the changes of the time, the NAACP had a relatively new rule that they would boycott performers who played at segregated venues. When it became apparent that Robinson would remain segregated, remember Robinson is the, the venue, uh, and they were going to have African Americans restricted to the balcony. The NAACP announced they should boycott this and any future Ellington performances if he went ahead and played the show at this Robinson Center or theater. So the music promoters in Little Rock, who were white, petitioned the Robinson Auditorium Commission asking them to desegregate the venue. Even if for only that one concert, the commission refused to do so, though the auditorium was finding it harder to book acts into a segregated house. They felt that if integrated, fewer tickets would be sold. So they didn't budge and Duke Ellington canceled. And I guess this was fairly common around that time. So I thought that was pretty cool. And the last little fun fact, the uh, 1977, also on September 5th, Voyager 1, the space probe, was launched. And that's, uh, yeah, it's more, of course, uh, not a ton to do with music, but it kind of is because, you know, the golden record is on Voyager 1. And Voyager 1 is supposed to, I think, like orbit Jupiter, go to some of the outer planets and then beyond. And, of course, the idea is that any other life forms that may, may find the record would have... All the examples, or se several examples of uh, music from planet Earth, and of course lots of other information from planet Earth, and just some of the music that's on there. We've got the Brandenburg Concerto, we've got Javanese Court Gamelon, we've got Senegal drum and flute music, we've got Beethoven Five, we've got Johnny Be Good. There's there's lots there. Other other um, Bach, I believe, Well Tempered Clavier, yeah, is on there with Glenn Gould. Beethoven Fifth and Bill and I, I think, are going to start a Kickstarter to shoot the new Tool album into space. So Stop. that. <laughs> yeah. Do you, yes. do you know Ben? Yes. The whole episode. We went the whole episode. Oh, God, so close. Do you know the controversy behind the the Golden Record? Like the what they were debating whether they should put on it. The, uh, no, not specifically. I guess not. The Chuck Berry was actually controversial because if you think about it, at the time, rock and roll was very young and it was not seen as like a legitimate art form. Um, and so oh, uh, people were saying this is just garbage meant for adolescents. And Carl Sagan, who was in charge of the project, had a great thought. He said, well, there are a lot of adolescents on Earth. <laughs> and so they, they included Chuck Berry. And so after this controversy, there was a Saturday Night Live uh sketch where they they had a, a program of newscasters but they were doing the news from tomorrow because all the newscasters were psychics and one of the <laughs> psychics said uh we you know have a report that the aliens have received the record and they send so they <laughs> said send more chuck berry send more chuck. <laughs> well that's why bill and i are petitioning to launch the new tool album into space that's right <laughs> That's yeah, because when they hear, there, there should also be some joke in there. The aliens hear Beethoven Fifth, and they're like, "Oh, not this piece again." We've heard this so many times. <laughs> but before I hand the mic back to Ben, I just want to uh, thank our other uh, uh, listeners who sent in questions: Jacob Cock, Logan Herrera, and Will Marinelli. I'm sorry we didn't get to your questions, but yeah, thanks for sending them in. And yeah, please do keep sending them in. We we really do like to use those. Well, thanks so much, everyone, and thanks especially to Jonathan Haas for joining us for episode 193, and we will see you on the next one. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan Haas. That's great. Keep up the great work, gentlemen. You're doing, you're doing such wonderful things in the percussion world. We all do it together. Thanks so for much. Sure. For sure. You too. Thank you.